Our next speaker is Sandra Ocapinti from the University of Western Australia. Um, Sandy will be presenting to us Unraveling Tropicana, Where, What, How and Why. Um, Sandy is, uh, completed a BSc in Geology at Monash University in 1992 and in 94 received an MSc for her work on Structural Geology, Metamorphism and Metasomatism in Low Temperature, High Pressure Metamorphic Belt in New Caledonia. Following this, she worked for the Geological Survey of Western Australia in the Regional Mapping Group. In 2004, she received a PhD from Curtin University, followed by a postdoc also at Curtin University prior to working for Fugro Airborne. Sandy then worked with Anglo Gold Ashanti in their Global Greenfields Project Generation Team, which work she's presenting today. In 2014, Sandy joined the Centre for Exploration Targeting, where she works on mineral systems analysis. Um, thank you, Sandy. Thanks, Mark. Can everyone hear me? Okay, so um, today I was asked to talk about Tropicana and I, you know, I worked um, in, the Albany, uh, uh, in the Albany Fraser um, Belt where Tropicana is located, it's a gold deposit, um, many years ago. So um, I had to kind of remove the cobwebs from my brain to put, to put this together and, and discuss it with my co-authors. So I have to um, acknowledge my co-authors, Ian Tyler and Catherine Spajari from the... Um, the uh, Geological Survey, and Keith Martin and Mark Doyle from Anglo Gold Ashanti. Okay, this one. So the Tropicana Gold Deposit, where is it? It's in Western Australia, a long way from here, and it's situated, um, it's situated in here in this Albany Fraser Belt, which is east of the Yilgarn Craton. Now, the Yilgarn Craton is a, um, an Archean... Um, Craton in here and it's got lots and lots of gold and nickel in it so it's quite exciting and basically but basically um, this region through here up until around about 2005 was considered to contain no Archean rocks really up in this part of the world and mainly be a mesoproto mesoproterozoic belt. But as you can see up here, I've written down that Tropicana is located in Neo-Archean rocks and they're dated between about 2,700 and 2,550 million years. And I'll, I'll talk about that during this talk. Here's just a bit of a blow-up um, cartoony map of the region. You can see here I've got the Tropicana zone through here, um, uh, which we're going to talk about a lot today. And that there are these other rocks through here which, are, which range from Paleoproterozoic all through here to Mesoproterozoic through here. This zone here, the Fraser Zone, you'll see me talk about as well again. And these are mafic, um, ultramafic. This is a belt of mafic, ultramafic rocks. And um, to the south um, west of Tropicana, quite a long ways to the south west, there's a um, quite a nice nickel deposit um, in, in these uh, Mesoproterozoic rocks. Um, so why all the fuss? Um, this region contains a Tropicana gold deposit. It's about an 8 million ounce gold deposit and, and, and rising. It's fairly low grade though. It was discovered in 20, um, 2005 and it was discovered um, basically because Western mining went there quite a long time before 2005 to look for nickel. So they went there looking for nickel. They grabbed some um, samples of the sand or the regolith that was, that was there because there's no outcrop here pretty much. Um, and they, they delineated a very, very low tenor gold anomaly. It's about a 10 ppb anomaly. And then they dropped it. And then some years later, Anglo Gold Ashanti, just before the company was ready to close its office doors in Australia, rediscovered it. So in 2005. So this is what the landscape looks like. Fairly um, uninspiring um, and very, very uh, difficult for the explorer. There's less than 5% outcrop in this region. So um, when I was with Anglo Gold, we were very keen on trying to understand the geology of this region. And uh, at about this, at, you know, in the early 2000s, the, 
the Geological Survey of Western Australia flew um, new aeromagnetics over the region because there had been a gold discovery there. And this, this is what I'm showing here, but the company also flew much more detailed magnetics. Um, funnily enough, at this sort of scale, it, they don't look very different. So I'm just showing the, um, uh, from, uh, for this whole talk, I'm just showing the pre-competitive data, because that is really mainly what we use. But you can see that the Tropicana zone is quite distinct in, um, in magnetic data, and in the next um, slide, I'll show you the, show you the gravity data. Um, it, it's, it's relatively higher, it has a relatively higher magnetic susceptibility overall. The magnetic texture is mottled to linear, um, and it's, so it's fairly distinct from zones um, to the east uh, and, and the west in here. So here's the Yulgun Craton in here. Um, here's that Fraser zone through here that I was talking about <coughs> earlier. This is the gravity through here. So basically, um, and it's overlain in transparency on the magnetics just to give you that sort of, that contextual feel to it. So you can see the Fraser zone, mafic culture, mafic rocks in here. Um, but what's really interesting in the Tropicana zone, you can see this sort of gravity gradient through here. So it's sort of a, I call it sort of a moderate gravity, gravity gradient. Um, and and we've, we used this while I was with the companies to try to delineate to, to map out the, the overall zone. So overall within this, you can see that the Tropicana zone lies within this northeasterly trending belt. But if you look at the magnetics, you can see that within those magnetics, we have quite a lot of this northwest trending um, magnetic foliation throughout that region. And you're able, so therefore I was able to use offsets in that, this magnetic foliation to, um, to, uh, to draw in faults through that region to, to complete a structural geophysical interpretation. Of, of this zone, and also we were able to use that to, to distinguish this area or those Tropicana rocks, those neo archean rocks from other rocks from, from the area. Also, um, also that's, another thing that's interesting is this northwest trending um, fabric is quite similar to northwest trending fabrics you see in the gold fields in the Yulgan Craton to the west. And this led a lot of early explorers or other people working in that region. And, and, and even in the, in the company, just to think that it was, it's just, it was just a continuation of the Yulgan that we were seeing here. Um, so I'll just go back one. So we had like a 2D perspective of what the region looked like. Um, but what we really wanted was we wanted to test our ideas by putting a seismic line through the area. And just before we go on, I just note that these black thin lines through here are all faults. Most of them are shallow to moderately um, dipping um, thrust faults that are dipping towards the southeast to east southeast. And I interpreted these faults quite early on before we had any seismic. Um, and the way we did it was we, com we um, completed forward modeling across different um, zones within the region to test, to test the ideas and on, on how these faults were offsetting the magnetic foliation throughout the region. Okay, so here's a seismic line. So Anglo Gold Ashanting and its um, partner, the Independence Group, um, paired up with the Geological Survey of Western Australia and the Federal Survey in Australia, GA, um, to run a reflection seismic line across, three reflection seismic lines, across the Albany Fraser Belt. Now this is the one just from the north and this is the only one I'm going to show today. But what you can see here just quickly is we can see this this group of relatively reflective rocks up here. Um, then this non-reflective band of rocks through here, another reflective package and nothing through here. Okay, now these little shadows through here, they just bends in the road, okay? So I've, I've put this seismic into GOCAD and I've, I haven't flattened it. I've put that in so that you can see where the bends in the road are so we can get an idea of what's going on with this line. Okay, so the first um, reflector I pointed out, this one here, we call this the plum ridge detachment, or really it's a plum ridge thrust. And this is what our Tropicana zone rocks sit on top of this. And underneath that, we have this paired, non-reflective, reflective, reflective um, part through here. And that's very similar to what we see in the Archean, um, in the Yulgun Craton um, size, reflection seismic line. So we think that this is our Yulgun Craton. And this is the moho. And you can see that there, there may be a bit of an offset in the moho in here. So we've either got an old subduction zone 
or we've just got an uneven moho. Okay, so I've just gone through that in the vertical section. In the horizontal section, in the map on the surface, you know, just from drilling basically, because we don't see much on the surface itself, we have this Tropicana zone of neo, neo um, Archaean rocks, and then this Burin up zone um, up there in, on, your, on your right um, of their Paleoproterozoic rocks that have intruded into the Neo Archaean rocks. Um, so here's just the interpretation in transparency over the top of the, uh, of the uh, seismic reflection data, and I've already showed, showed, and I've got that for you in the bottom part of the diagram as well. And basically you can see we've got this like fold and thrust belt up here. So when you make, do the actual structural interpretation over that, um, that data, you, you see this sort of fold and thrust belt sort of uh, geometries in here. Um, but the other interesting thing is you get this these funny little offsets in these different um, pa packages within the Archean through here. So these little funny offsets that I was alluding to before in the Yamana terrain of the Yulgarn Craton, we think are uh, um, they're, 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 um, normal faults, okay? So what we think is that the Yulgarn at some stage actually extended, okay? So it's, it's, it's extended, this is an extended part of the Yulgarn margin, and later on there are actually other um, uh, kinematic indicators in, in, um, in this um, interpretation which suggest that it's basically been pushed back up a bit. Um, the other thing to note is that in the um, upper crust here, the Tropicana zone is more deformed than the Birinup zone. Okay, so it's undergone more deformation. So it gives us a bit of a clue on the structural history of that region. Um, now, um, Anglo Gold was so impressed by the reflection seismic um, survey that then they um, commissioned High Size to complete two 2D reflection seismic lines, and they're about eight kilometres long each, um, and they see to about three kilometres deep at the deposits. And what these found was that basically the structure within these is very similar to what we see in the large scale reflection seismic line, but you can see the gold loads here and you can see that they just, they're open at depth. Consequently, um, Anglo Gold also had a 3D seismic um, survey um, commissioned, um, but I can't show you that unfortunately. Okay, so the rocks. Okay, so I've been banging on about the Tropicana zone. So what, what, what do the rocks look like there? So this is what they look like, basically. Um, in, within the Tropicana zone, we can see that the, the rocks there might be a little bit more dense than rocks around it. And that's because we're, we're looking at um, rocks that are bordering on garnet amphibolites. These are basically um, uh, metamorphosed mafic granites, if you like. So they're um, garnet, um, amphibole, biotite, sort of uh, plagioclase, gneisses, um, and these are the two, these are the neoarchean rocks that make up most of the Tropicana zone, and they're certainly um, located at the deposit. Um, also at the deposit, there are these cyanidic, um, granitic sort of rocks in here. They're full of case feldspar and biotite. Um, and the other thing we see is that we see this rock here, uh, fractured to form like a, um, a crackle breccia and this sort of mosaic or crackle breccia is filled by biotite plus pyrite and it's within the pyrite that the gold resides. So we have these very high grade rocks here, high metamorphic grade, so um, they're amphibolite to granulite facies. They're, these ones here are probably amphibolites because they contain um, Quite, you know, the amphibole, they're sort of amphibole garnet um, compositions, but there are some granulites um, imbricated within this sequence because there are two pyroxene mafic, um, uh, mafic gneisses. And then also around the deposit, we have these um, banded iron formations, um, which are they're greenerite bearing, so they're sort of being metamorphosed to the amphibolite facies. Um, these have been metamorphosed at the, at the green schist facies, so these contain K feldspar biotite, pyrite, essentially, and some sericite as well. All right, so we know the age of the rocks, as I've told you, but some, there's something very special about these rocks in that 
even though the igneous crystallisation age is about 2720, they have been metamorphosed between about 2700 right through to about 2630, we think. Okay, so they've been undergone very high grade metamorphism in places, probably not everywhere, um, over between 60 million years and 100 million years. That's the interpretation from the geochronologist. Okay, so um, basically, uh, so protolists to the granite gneisses are dated around 2700. They, there are rounded football sized gra um, zircon grains um, that crystallise within these rocks, and they're very unusual, and they are metamorphic zircons. And they are dated between 2690 to 2560 million years. Um, so that's what some of those zircons look like. They're really weird, okay? They're just blebby zircons, and these are metamorphic zircons. What about the age of mineralisation? Okay, so we've got the age of the protolith at, at, at Neo-Archean, at two, 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 that's 2720, say, to, 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 towards 2640. Um, we've got an age of metamorphism at around 2640, or that, that 100 million years, perhaps, of metamorphism. What about the age of, of mineralisation? Well, the mineralisation um, is in the green schist facies, so we know it's later, because it's overprinting the, the prograde uh, uh, mineral assemblages. And um, the company, actually, under the guidance of Mark Doyle, completed quite a lot of dating to try to nail the age of mineralisation down. Now, when I went to work for Anglo Gold Ashanti, the first thing I was given was a report on the argon-argon dating of biotite. Now, I just finished my PhD on argon-argon dating, and I did not believe these results. Okay, we had these weird rocks, and we had these... Some of the, these are the best step heating profiles out of all the, the, the step heating experiments that were completed. We got these, this 2.5 uh, giga year age or 2,500 million year old age, an unknown age for mineralisation in that region. At about the same time, um, Mark had some um, uh, lead lead dating on rutile completed. And again, this 2,500 to 2,400 million year old sort of peak came out for the age of metamorphism. And at about the same time, um, Remium osmium on, py on pyrite um, uh, dating was completed. And again, another around about 2,500 age. Um, now, these uh, all have different closure temperatures. Um, and I have no doubt that the age of mineralisation at Tropicana must be around 2,500 based on these. So we're going from in the Rutile, we have a closure temperature of about... Of about um, what's going on with the timer? OK, at <laughs> the Rutile, with a closure temperature of about 550 um, degrees um, centigrade, and uh, the biotite, the closure temperature of about, say, 350 degrees centigrade. OK, so let's start to put this together, this information that we've been going through into an interpretation essentially. So we have um, our, our 2,700 million year old rocks through here in our Tropicana zone, and, and that's the same age as, as, min, as nickel mineralisation in the Yulgarn Craton, OK? So our, whereas, uh, you know, and the, and the development of um, uh, the Camardio flows within the, within the Yulgarn Craton. Um, we have a high-grade metamorphic event that goes right up to about 26, 40 million years, and that's the same at time as gold mineralisation and late granites within the Yulgarn Craton, so quite different to what's going on in the Yulgarn Craton. And um, we have a um, low-grade metamorphic event, or low-grade Brinjus facies metamorphic event in the Tropicana terrain or Tropicana zone at about the same time, um, and, and no equivalent in the Yulgarn, essentially. Um, Overprinting um, the Neo-Archean events uh, in, in the Tropicana zone, there's a whole series of Proterozoic uh, reworking. Now, I'm not going to say much about this because I don't have much time, but basically this Proterozoic reworking is all extensional. There's not much going on, and that's why we don't see very complicated structure in these rocks, um, in the seismic line, and actually even in drill core. Now, before in the um, seismic line, I illustrated to you that the, the upper crustal part of that seismic line above the plumage detachment or plum, plumage thrust looks like it looked like perhaps, it, perhaps an imbricated thrust system 
just like in the Moyne thrust system in, in, northwest Sco in, uh, in northern Scotland. Okay, so how did these rocks at Tropicana form? Um, so one idea is that there are these, these rocks through here, some of them are these things called sinucatoids, which are basically um, like high magnesium adakitic rocks. The idea with those is that, is that they, is that they um, formed um, through melting above an old subduction zone. So that's what I've got here, that perhaps the proto-tropicana zone developed over an old subduction zone initially, but the, but the rock stayed in the lower, in the, in the granulite to amphibolite facies or in the lower crust for about 100 million years, because that's what our metamorphism is telling us. By, at about 2,500 million years ago, the rocks were thrust over, the tropicana zone was thrust over the Yilgun craton via the plum ridge detachment or plum ridge thrust, essentially. And that's when our mineralisation um, uh, came into play. So there was potassium metasomatism accompanied the mineralisation, so classic orogenic gold, basically. The um, tropicana zone was uplifted into green schist facies, um, and you can read the rest. And that's basically just a summary of that, but what I've got here, and this should be, I think, in the paper that you received, um, is that the other thing we see is that prior to the plum ridge detachment, uh, prior to development of the plum ridge detachment and thrusting um, of the Tropicana zone over the Yulgun Craton, the Yulgun had actually rifted. So it is possible, even, that the, um, you know, perhaps this, this Tropicana zone was originally related to the Yulgun. Maybe it was a rifted part of the Yulgun. We don't know. So back to one of our first questions, where to next? How do we use this information that we, under, that we know now to, to, to decide where to go to next to find another gold deposit within the Albany Fraser Belt? Well, if you look at just the very regional magnetics, this mottled zone is still king. We don't have anything like that down in here. We have this gravity gradient We've got our maps, so we know more or less where our, we think, where our um, neo Archean rocks are through mapping and through drilling, basically, and, and uh, stru uh, structural geophysical interpretation. We can use our mineral systems analysis, and I call this my mineral systems diamond, same sort of thing as the circles, really. Um, and we can look for deep crustal scale structures, we can look for tectonic triggers, we can look for common fertility elements or proxies for these. Um, zones of preservation to, to map and to integrate into a model. And that's what I've done here. So I've got my Tropicana type rocks, the Neo Archean rocks, so this is an interpretation of one of them. Gravity gradients through here. Um, this is a, uh, a complexity of structure layer with the structures overlain. And this is a potassium radiometrics image. Now, I'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute. Now, if we overlay just the first three, the structure, the gravity, um, and the um, Tropicana rocks, really, we get this. So this is a heat map for the region. That's only 18 kilometres through there. So you can see that these prospective zones aren't that big uh, on a regional scale. And you get these uh, in the heat maps you can see that these really um, red zones would be where I would consider to be the most prospective areas to go to in terms of looking for um, gold mineralisation in that region. If we add in the um, potassium radiometrics um, data, we can narrow things down a bit um, to these regions in here. Now, I don't know how real that really is because the, the region is covered by sand. But the reason I put it on is because recently I've had a student working um, on a deposit that is buried by 400 metres of lithified cover and you can see the footprint of that deposit in the regolith. It's bizarre, okay? And you can see it in a combination of ASTA data and potassium radiometrics. It's just that you have to look at the very, very low level signals in these, in these data. Hmm. Okay. But where to next regionally? This is our Tropicana line. This is our Plum Ridge detachment. This is another line. This is a, a seismic line that 
It's called NY1 that, that cuts across part of the Yilga and Kraton um, to the north northwest. And see this reflector here. This is about there's about 80 kilometres between these lines. There's one of the lines here, Tropicana. There's that other line through here. Perhaps the, the Plumridge detachment actually comes all the way out here somewhere. So this is a project now that um, Mark, Lindsay and I are working on. We're work working on integrating a whole range of other data sets to see whether or not we can extend the prospectivity of, of this Tropicana zone. And I think that's it really. Thank you, I'll leave you with those words. Thank you, Sandy, for that uh, very interesting presentation. Um, any questions for Sandy before we move on to the next speaker? Yeah, how soon after the thrusting was this, did this crystallize, do you think? I think it probably happened with that thrusting. So as it came up into, so, so basically as you hydrated the system and, you know, so you pumped your fluids through um, to retrograde those, prograde, those old prograde assemblages. Um, it, it's, it's happening then. So it's all the same system, yeah. Looks like I'm off the hook. Any other questions? No, not just yet. No? Okay. So thank you very much, Sandy.